Welcome back to what's new with Mead. This is uh, part number three, or episode three, I guess. Today we're going to be discussing um, the main topic of, I'm calling it the flavor debate. What I really mean is real flavoring um, versus artificial flavoring. So there's, we'll dive further into that, but basically the difference between using real apples and then, um, of course, using fake apples or an artificial flavoring. We're also going to, going to discuss um, some clearing agents and the methods that kind of go behind that. Uh, we have lots of options in that regard. So uh, I'm excited to get to talk to you guys again. Of course, if you haven't checked out the first and second episode, uh, go back and listen to those because you might be able to find some information that you like. Um, this is available on, of course, YouTube. If you're watching it there, you're seeing the video of this. If you are just listening, you might be listening on Spotify, on Apple uh, Podcasts. I think it's on iHeartRadio now. I need to double check that. But hopefully it's uh, getting out there. And if you enjoy these episodes, of course, make sure to rate, or, uh, you know, leave a like, rate, do whatever down there to uh, help support the podcast. So um, first things first, let me tell you what I'm kind of sipping on. Uh, this is currently, I think it's like three in the afternoon on a Saturday. So uh, I decided today's not the, or right now is not the moment to go too heavy with my, my uh, choice of beverage. So this is a Blackberry Braggot that I have, and it is my first beer that I've made since the channel got started. Uh, and it, it's a braggot, which means what we talked about last week, um, honey and water and yeast make the, your, your mead. And then a beer, of course, is all your malt and your grains and all that stuff. Basically, you just slam them together in one way or another. If you want to know more about that, check out last episode. Um, but it's a mead uh, beer combination. And it's a blackberry meat like combination. So I put real blackberries in this. Um, and I, I really like this one. I need to make another one. It was a pale uh, ale base for the beer, and then of course the mead mixture, I believe is clover honey, um, I'm not sure what else. Anyways, it's really good, nice and carbonated, I bottle carbonated it, and um, it's it's refreshing. It's definitely um, not exactly light, I will say, uh, it's still 10% ABV, so, um, you know, but it is lighter than if I picked up one of my 14% meads. So, uh, I'm going to be sipping on that tonight, or tonight, this afternoon. Um, yeah. Okay, so, uh, we're going to discuss a couple things today. Big thing, uh, of course, part number one, basically every time, I'm just going to tell you what I'm drinking on and how I made it. I just told you that. Real simple. We talked about braggots a lot last time. Uh, and uh, next time, of course, I'll probably have something more intricate. I want to get into part two. Part two is, uh, we're going to start talking about those main questions. What's the difference between real um, fruit or real flavorings and artificial flavorings? And like to what capacity does like the flavor change? So what I've noticed, um, I'm actually in my mead room. If you're watching this on YouTube, you probably see it. I am in my mead room and I have some examples of some artificial flavors. Now, Amoretti is a company that makes, I'm going to say in quotations, um, artificial flavors. Basically flavors that are not your uh, direct fruit, your direct whatever you're looking for. Um, they have some pretty wild stuff, like lots of cookie flavors, birthday cake, um, chocolates, and everything you can think of. They do stuff for baking, all that stuff. Anyways, they've got brewing options too, but um, they they do a really great job of, of presenting the real flavor. And that's because with at least their fruits, um, they are putting real fruit into these like purees in these mixtures. So uh, it's hard to use Amoretti as a great example for this as artificial flavoring because they actually use real um, fruit, real ingredients in it, and they just make it kind of more of a, um, you know, a <laughs> stronger way to uh, flavor a mead, flavor a, a alcohol. So I'm not going to talk about them a ton, ton but I did, did want to mention that they uh, they do a lot of great stuff. So go check them out. So I'll mention them briefly. But the artificial flavorings I do want to talk about, I actually have an example of them. Let me grab one. Here is, oh, that's not a good example. Here is, oh, there we go. I have, this is from Brewer's Best. Now this is the artificial flavoring that I want to um, 
kind of harp on and, and, and talk about. This is uh, all natural flavoring for beer and wine, blah, 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 that's all it really says. Basically, this is not, um, this is less dense and it's not like a, uh, a jam more as like the uh, Amoretti stuff is. This is literally very watery. This is a cherry flavoring, a natural flavoring. Now this stuff, it works um, and it flavors your mead, but it, it's very obvious. And so that's what I want to kind of dive into. The differences between artificial flavoring and real flavoring is to me, the consistency that a real cherry or a real, I'm gonna use cherries for example, since I had this in front of me. If I put real cherry into something, I believe there's a consistency, a mouthfeel that is different from if I, if I use artificial cherry flavoring. There's of course also um, a difference in the flavoring. I have found, um, and I've actually used some of this cherry stuff before, I've used uh, a couple other of their natural, brewer's best natural flavorings, and the thing I noticed is that it, it doesn't, it tastes like cherry. And I put quotes around that because um, it's not exactly like the taste of a cherry that you think of. It, it's more, I'm gonna use the word chemically, um, than like the real cherry. So uh, I have noticed that you get this kind of chemical taste, you get, it just doesn't feel real. And I think it's like the difference between if you eat, let's say like a, um, a cherry popsicle, and then you eat an actual cherry. Like you, you know that the popsicle is not real cherries, generally. Um, so I, I noticed that, I noticed that in the mouthfeel consistency, uh, the taste is generally different. I, I have always, had better luck using real fruit, and um, so I try to do it as best I can. So the, that's the main difference is you do get this this taste difference, and I, I do wanna promote and tell you, you need to go out and try this stuff on your own, because I can sit here and explain to you all of my experiences with using real banana flavoring and fake banana flavoring and blah, 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 and all this stuff, but until you try it yourself, you're not gonna know. I mean, it's great to hear descriptors, but uh, you'll learn more from trying it on your own accord. So uh, I encourage you to try that. Go buy some, some artificial flavorings and use real fruit and compare the two. Um, of course, I'll give you my opinion still, but I think that experience on your end will help a lot too. So uh, I, I see the biggest reference I can make or thing about uh, artificial flavorings that I like is that you can get flavor profiles easier um, than than maybe adding real fruit. For example, some fruits, and I'm using fruits a lot because that's what most of these are, um, some fruit flavorings are really hard to impart in a meat. For example, uh, I used, I said banana flavoring earlier. Banana is so hard to get imparted into a mead. I made probably within my first like 12 meads, a strawberry and banana mead, literally cut up, made a mead, cut up uh, strawberries, cut up some bananas, and put them into the mead created a ton of sediment that was a big issue but also it just did not impart this banana the banana flavoring was not something that just really wanted to pop and that's very true of many other flavorings um, it's not exclu exclusive to just fruits it's a you know other flavorings can do the same thing but uh, in my experience i've had trouble getting those odd fruit flavors to really happen that's where artificial flavorings can help using a um, artificial banana flavoring that is more concentrated can actually get that flavor to be promoted into your mead. Of course, there are drawbacks, like I talked about. You can have a um, maybe a little, like a hint of a more chemically taste, not necessarily more natural. The mouthfeel changes a little bit consistency, but you're, uh, you're achieving those flavors that you're trying to get. So um, that's the pro of using artificial flavoring. Um, another pro is that Sometimes you don't have to use as many like fruits. Like when I'm flavoring a cherry mead, for example, and I wanna use real cherries, um, for one gallon of mead, I might need three to four pounds of cherries to get that flavor to pop like I want, which in the expense world can be expensive. Um, so this stuff, like this Brewer's Best, even uh, Amoretti's flavoring, which I'll talk about here in a moment, um, can, it's cheaper and you can get more flavor out of it. For example, this whole thing, this Brewer's Best, um, is, it says one ounce per gallon. Um, you can continue to add it. This is four fluid ounces. So this thing right here supposedly can flavor four gallons. 
and I think it was like nine bucks. So that nine dollar expense, um, as opposed to maybe all those cherries, my four pounds of cherries times four, 16 pounds of cherries times, let's say the three bucks a pound, um, that's expensive, you know? It, the cost side thing's nice. Um, I would prefer to use all natural fruit because I do think it helps the flavoring, gives it more real flavoring, but the problem is the expense of it and the sheer quantity of just like how many um, maybe apples or, or whatever you're using you need for a mead. Um, or wine, or beer, whatever you're doing. Let's flip the, the uh, table over a little bit and talk about um, Amoretti's side. Now, Amoretti is a different than the Brewer's Best. The Brewer's Best stuff is more artificial. It's not quite real flavoring. It doesn't taste as real. Amoretti is actually using real fruit. Basically, uh, imagine pureed fruit, concentrated flavoring um, from actual fruit putting put into you know, a bottle, and then you use that. I like Amoretti because they provide a lot of different flavors. Like I'm looking at, behind here, you can't see it on the camera, but um, there's, I have a marshmallow flavoring I see, vanilla bean, uh, speculus cookie, orange cream, birthday cake, grape, uh, pumpkin pie, all of these flavorings that are uh, kind of off the wall, like would be hard to, ooh, would be hard to uh, recreate. Um, uh, there are available. So I would suggest, you know, if you're trying to do something like that, it's nice to uh, to have those capabilities. There's also the side of it that you're spending less money. This wild berry flavoring that I'm holding in my hand right now is eight ounces, probably about 15 to $20 for the whole thing. This thing can flavor five gallons of mead. Now, depending on how many berries, how many whatever you're trying to get for your flavor, um, you're gonna spend a lot more money than that. So I highly suggest using, sometimes, if you have to, um, arti artificial flavoring for ease, all those things. Of course, it is a drawback. There are drawbacks. Um, you're not using real fruit. And a lot of people are, and that, a lot of people get really frustrated about that because we wanna use real fruits. We wanna use real ingredients. And I believe that the your mead, the best, you know, what it is it comes from its flavor, it's uh, ingredients. If you use high quality ingredients, you're gonna get a high quality mead. If you use low quality ingredients, you get a low quality mead, like in honey. If you use cheap honey, guess what? You're gonna have a weird taste in mead. If you use really expensive honey, you're gonna have a pretty nice tasting mead. Um, just keep that in mind as you're making your own stuff. Uh, cost should not matter all the time, but it does quite often. Um, cost often leads or can lead to a better tasting mead. Now, I'm not saying that you can't make a good mead on a $10 budget. Uh, I'm saying it's a little harder if you don't know how to quite do it, how to master that idea. So, um, really the difference between artificial and real flavorings is uh, the strength of them and expense. Uh, and honestly, there's consistency issues, things like that that we run into and I, uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm definitely a fan of, of using real fruit and I will continue to do that, but I'll also use artificial flavorings for the things that uh, are harder to get, like pumpkin pie. So, um, that's the big thing there. My next thing I wanna talk about, uh, there are a bunch of different options for clearing your mead or wine or beer. Um, the reason we clear things is because it, it makes a product look nicer. I mean, quite frankly, the difference between a, a clear see-through mead and a very cloudy mead, it, when I look at it, I will always pick the mead that is more clear. Now, in my own brewing experience, I have made a lot of unclear meads that have turned out pretty good. The problem is, when you're giving them out to people, a lot of times people will t see something that is cloudy and go, oh, I don't know about that, that looks sketchy. But if it's clear, they go, ooh, that looks really nice. And unfortunately, that's kind of the world we live in. Um, a, lot of the, a lot of our world is about views, like, does that look good? Yes, then I'll try that. Instead of maybe the actual experience of it, even if it doesn't look good. So, um, that's a whole other topic, anyways. Let's talk about the things you can use to clarify. We have some very simple ones that are um, not white powder based. And when I say white powders, I mean stuff like uh, 
uh, white powders, I think of our potassium sorbate, potassium metabisulfite, um, Camden tablets, which are basically potassium metabisulfite. Um, and what else is there? Uh, pectic enzyme, all those things are white powders that we can put in meads for various reasons. The uh, white powders that we use for clearing are things like bentonite, um, sparkloid, those are a couple of them. Uh, I thought there's another one I'm thinking of, Easy Clear, I think is what it's called. Uh, those can be introduced into a mead in the secondary, whenever, basically to help take anything, any particles in suspension. Um, that are just floating around, which clouds up your mead, and make them fall to the bottom. I have personally used um, bentonite before. I've never used Sparkloid. I've never used uh, Easy Clear. Uh, I do know that they are, they're pretty good too. Again, they take, uh, what do you call them? Things in suspension, make them drop. Um, they work well. I think that they, actually, I'll talk about that in a moment. My experience with bentonite. Bentonite looks like gravel. It's really weird. It's like this uh, gravel or like kitty litter. Basically, it's like really coarse uh, looking kitty litter kind of thing you put in your mead and it uh, clears it up. It basically, uh, I don't know all the science behind it, but I do know that it, it brings those particles out of suspension and, and often takes everything and just settles it at the bottom, which is great because then you're getting yourself a pretty clear looking mead. Um, there's a... Big issue that I discovered with bentonite. Bentonite, when I used it, I used it on a Tupelo mead, which if you know anything about Tupelo honey, it's not exactly the cheapest honey in the world. It is a little expensive. Um, it definitely is like something that I would use for smaller batches. I'd never buy a bunch because three pounds of it was like $25, $30, something like that. So it gets pretty pricey. That's a small batch though, so maybe in, in bulk quantity it's cheaper. Anyways, uh, before I put the two, or the uh, bentonite in, I taste tested my Tupelo mead. It had really good character. Tupelo honey has like a smoky character. It's, uh, it's sweet. Um, it has uh, warm notes to it. It's really nice honey. After the bentonite, the flavor profile of that mead changed drastically. The flavors were kind of stripped away from the mead, which was unfortunate because it was really, really good. And it kind of became like lackluster boring, to be honest. Partially because that bentonite is a big chemical that is pulling things out. It is doing its job, which is clearing up the mead, but it is also taking away flavor. It changed that profile. And that's why I'm not a big fan of using bentonite. I can't speak to Sparkloid. I can't speak to uh, Easy Clear. I can only speak to bentonite and say, it changed my mead flavor, and I'm not the biggest fan of that. Um, if you have experience with Sparkloid Easy Clear, let me know if you've had that experience, because I would love to hear from you. But I, I think you can use those things and find success. Maybe that was a fluke. Maybe uh, it doesn't normally strip flavor away from the uh, mead in general, but it might. I don't know. I'll have to try Sparkloid Easy Clear. Let's flip to the more natural sides of um, clearing. So one of the natural choices you have when you're trying to clear a mead is this thing called cold crashing. So cold crashing is where you take your, let's say you have a gallon of mead, like I have behind me, and um, it's rather unclear. You have the option to go ahead and basically put that into a, a cold crashing chamber, which is essentially just a refrigerator, um, that is set to like 35, 36, not quite freezing temperature. What happens is all that mead gets that cold, and then the same idea that happens with bentonite and uh, sparkloid and easy clear, those particles go out of suspension, therefore clearing up the mead and fall to the bottom. I've used this very successfully, uh, which is nice. I use this method quite a bit because I, I enjoy it. It's really nice, um, and it doesn't use any chemicals. So you don't really change the flavor. I haven't noticed a huge flavor change over that. So I'll often cold crash my meads, which is really simple. It does take time. You need to cold crash for probably three to seven days or more. And it uh, doesn't work for everything though. Uh, I have a peppermint mead that I made. It's one of my like candy canes I, I started. Um, it, this last time I did it, I used actual peppermints and I've been cold crashing this thing uh, for Oh gosh, it's been a long time, and it's not 
clearing up that way. So uh, there's a good chance I might have to actually go through and use a bentonite or a spark cloid or something. Um, so the only thing I want to mention is cold crashing. Sometimes people equate cold crashing to uh, getting rid of yeast, like killing the yeast. In truth, it doesn't do that. It, cold crashing is not like using potassium sorbate or potassium metabisulfite. When you cold crash, you're simply making the yeast go dormant. So even if your mead has finished, um, oftentimes there's still some yeast floating around in there. If you rack it over, there still might be some yeast floating around. When you take that and you put it into a, um, a cold crashing chamber, you're just making it really cold, the yeast go dormant. Then the moment you take it out of the cold crash chamber and the yeast heat back up, uh, if you've added any more sugar, or if there is still sugar for them to feast on, and they haven't hit their cap for their ABV, more than likely you're going to have re-fermentation. It's happened to me many times, I had to learn, learn it the hard way, so I just want to warn you about that. Don't consider cold crashing as a alternative for potassium sorbate or potassium metabisulfite for stabilizing your meat. Uh, there's, a, there's a couple other options for clearing, and I'll get the last one's rather frustrating, but this, this one's not too bad. Uh, there's a way you can filter your meads, which means that you basically, as you're moving into a different bottle or into a different container, you're uh, filtering them through these tiny, tiny little grates, and you have to have a system for this filtering stuff. I don't have one. Um, they get kind of expensive because you get down to the micron scale. If you know anything about microns, um, they are the tiny, tiny, tiny particles. When you think of, uh, imagine, I'm trying to think of like a strainer. If you had like a really, really, like a regular strainer for whatever pasta, it's just like super, super tiny holes down to the microscopic scale. And a lot of times companies will do that with their meads. They will uh, filter it through especially commercial meads, before they bottle because it clears it up. Um, and you can get systems to do that. Uh, just look online and they cost some money though. That's my only problem with them. Um, the biggest thing is I have heard, and I don't have exact experience with this because again, I don't have a system. So I cannot say that I've done this myself. I've heard that the filtering system can sometimes actually take away some flavor from your mead. And that's because you're getting down to such a small scale, one to two microns, that little particles um, that are the mead flavor can get stuck in that filter and then not make its way into your actual mead. Now that could be, you know, I, I need to try this for myself. This is totally speculation from what I've heard and read about using filtering systems. So I'm a little leery of doing that myself. I don't know. That's just my opinion. The last one way you can clear up a mead is most frustrating of all, time. You would be shocked at how much time actually takes those particles and helps them fall out of suspension. Um, and when I talk about time, sometimes the base amount of time you have to spend to wait for it to clear can be up to like a year. So you have to find a lot of patience. And my remedy for patience, if you're curious, is to make more mead so that you're not sitting there waiting and staring at that thing. Um, and waiting for it to be finished. You can have other things to occupy yourself with. If you can, of course. Uh, if you can't, then you're kind of stuck watching paint dry. Um, that's the only problem with mead. And some meads will, over time, uh, clear up really well. Some meads will not. I had a mead, I had a pear mead that I made, and I did not use pectic enzyme in the beginning, which was my biggest fault, which would have helped clear it up in the first place. Um, it sat for two years, didn't clear up a bit. So, that's just kind of how life works. Sometimes the time thing doesn't work. Sometimes you have to use bentonite, easy clear, um, sparkloid, stuff like that. Uh, clearing your mead is really important if you want to be, I think, a commercial mead maker, for one, uh, or if you just want to have a really nice looking product. I don't want to put all the emphasis on a good mead being clear because I've had plenty of meads that are good that are not clear. Um, but I do think when you're presenting the mead to your friends, family, whoever, that clarity makes a huge difference. So just keep that in mind as you're brewing your stuff. If you want to clear, you have those options. Um, now, the last section of this little podcast, I want to talk about some mead failures that I've had recently and uh, some successes. So most recently, my biggest mead failure um, wasn't the end of the world, but 
I, uh, I recently rearranged my mead room, and if you're watching on video, you might see some different things. I built this, I'll talk about that in a second, I built a cabinet, all that stuff. Um, I was trying to move a mead over and, uh, and bottle it, and my, it's, you know, what I do whenever I'm recording them, oftentimes I will just say, I will, you know, tell the people, I'll say, hey, I'm going to bottle this real fast and be right back. Well, I said that, I had my phone in my hand, and I was sitting there going from bottle to bottle, just like filling it up, and then got distracted. Next thing I know, I've got mead everywhere, because I had just sat there and it zoned out enough to where all this, I lost all this mead, probably only like two bottles, um, to basically the ground, because I was being dumb. So uh, I'd say if you're bottling things, um, I've learned that I need to not have my phone in my hand because I get distracted really easily. Uh, just watch yourself and you know make sure you're doing that. Uh, the other failure I had, I think you might have seen it on YouTube, is I tried to make a wild uh, yeast mead. Did not work, I will say that. So uh, if you wanna know about that, how that went or what I did, uh, go check it out. Basically, wild yeast, um, the wrong wild yeast took over. So I'm going to experiment with that in the future. So now, the, as far as successes have gone, um, I have made a couple iterations of some of my classic meads. The apple cinnamon mead is a big one. The peppermint mead for me is a large one I really like. Um, those things I've been making bigger batches of and I've had fantastic success in doing those because I think I'm getting my method down. Now, uh, I will also talk about this, this thing behind me, uh, which if you're on podcast, you can't, he, you can't see, but this is my mead little closet, as I'm calling it. And um, this is just holding all my meads. This thing's pretty big. It holds up to, a, I think I figured out the, it can hold up to six, uh, six gallon glass carboys in it. Then below, you can't see, but this is, these drawers are holding a bunch of carboys as well. Um, I, I think that my success here is that I finally made something that will hold all my meads that I need, and uh, that's that's kind of nice. You should try to keep yourself organized with mead making so that you don't get stuff mixed around. Fortunately, I uh, make labels, so as I'm bottling things, I try to label them so I don't get them confused with other stuff. I've got a couple bottles that I forgot to label in time, and so I have no idea what's in them. I'm sure I'll have a party one day and uh, crack them open and try and figure out what they are. But um, try to label your stuff, whether it be temporary little, just like tiny labels that say, hey, this is a peach mead, or if you go all out like I do. So uh, that's that. I hope you guys have uh, learned something today about mead making. This has been a lot of fun. Um, I really enjoy mead making, and I think that um, at the end of the day, our goal is to be, uh, is to con continue to grow, continue to make better recipes, but also to start to share our mead. So you should be sharing your mead, your um, experiences with your friend, because mead is one of those things that not a lot of people know about. Uh, most people have never heard of mead. People who have are like, oh, that's that Viking stuff, right? That's, or that's that from that Budweiser commercial, and then we've got a bad rap for it because, you know, in the Budweiser commercial, they made fun of us. Anyways, um, mead's really good, and you should be sharing it with your friends. Uh, I try to share as much as I can. I've got a bunch of stuff. Uh, that's why I'm making a lot of my repeat recipes, is so that I can share those success ones with my friends. Of course, keep bottles for myself, but um, I'm just getting my, my standards down, quote. So if you enjoyed this, make sure if you're listening on uh, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, anything like that, that you uh, rate. That helps us you know, get the, the, uh, the podcast to go far and to be seen. Um, and then, of course, if you're on YouTube, just make sure you leave a like and subscribe, share with some friends. I'd love to continue to uh, not only educate you, but maybe someone else in your life if I can. So uh, I'll be back with episode four, two weeks from the day from uh, whatever this is, it was Wednesday. This one's coming out Wednesday, February, oh, I was trying to find it, February 5th. So I'll be back on the 19th with episode four. If you have any recommendations for what you want to hear about, um, I will gladly take them. I would love to chat with you guys. I've got a list of things to talk about, and I'm sure that, uh, uh, you know, I'll gladly uh, put new things on that list. So I um, hope you've enjoyed. I hope you have a wonderful day. Share your mead. Share your mead experiences with your friends. And, uh, of course, you know, with that, cheers. Cheers.